Thank you for everyone here for showing up. Uh, Stop and Con. This is what, third year? Yeah, this is a good guy. I come here every year and it's getting better and better. So I'm glad to help to contribute each year. And this is my way of contributing. Um, welcome to the Comics and Higher Education panel. I probably should have put all that title on the slide, but I didn't. And I got to put Stop and Con logo in there. Uh, I'm John Boltino. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, we have three of us today. Uh, to my right, I have Morgan Rose Pershing. That's her name on the thing. And then that's, uh, the other guy is Michael Barber. And we all have kind of our independent uh, experiences in using comics in higher education. And we're going to talk about them today. And then hopefully uh, we'll do about 10 to 15 minute presentations each. And at the end of that, we are going to do a Q&A. So if you have questions or comments or anything concerns, think we're corrupting the youth or whatever, let us know. All right, so I'm going to have, I'm going to hand it over here to Michael's up first. And you have a clicker. And you want to stand up and do it or you want to? I'm going to do it finally. I can, I can sit. Oh, okay. microphones are here. There you go. Uh, okay. All right. So we'll start with mine. Mine's uh, that's me, Michael Barba. I teach at the Merced College, which is a community college in the Central Valley. Um, okay. Um, just to start, just give you a little bit of background about me. I, I did grow up in the Central Valley, actually not far from here, in a little community called Riverbank, in California, right outside of Modesto. So, you know, I, I, I'm local, fairly local. Uh, I went uh, to Modesto Junior College, then I transferred to Humboldt State University. I did a year of study at the University of Sheffield. Um, where actually the University of Sheffield is where I kind of first uh, began to like, I guess, study popular culture because um, I was studying literature, I could study literature and film, which was which I thought was really cool because uh, the Humboldt program is so, so traditional, you know, literature, English program. Uh, I did my master's degree at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and uh, I'm currently uh, pursuing a PhD at the University of California in Merced. So uh, I just can't stop going to school. Although I think this is it. I think that dissertation is sucking the life right out of me. So I think it's got to be the end of it for me. Um, and I've been employed with Merced College since uh, the year 2000. I was uh, there first as a part time employee, then uh, eventually hired as a full time employee. And I teach uh, English. Um, I chose comics because I found for several reasons. One was a personal connection. I just found that I had a connection to comic books. Oh, sorry. Um, that I had a connection to uh, comic books, specifically superhero comics. So that's kind of been my area of interest um, with using comics. Um, I wanted. I was also interested in, uh, as a teacher, and I think we can all attest to this up here. Um, it's hard to connect to students. With, no matter how cool and hip you think you might be, <laughs> you're always a step behind. <laughs> and, uh, so I try to find multiple medium by which to reach students. So I thought, okay, here's another medium, never used in class. And this was back in like 1999. Um, I, I matter of fact, before I, became, I came to Merced, I was at Modesto Junior College when I tried this. And uh, um, so I thought, I'm gonna try a, a comic book in class and see how that works. Um, I, there's also reason, another reason, like I said, is that students are confronted by so many types of texts. Um, you know, television, movie, not just books, but television, movies, uh, music. With the internet, we've opened up, you know, all kinds of uh, various texts. Social media now, I mean, it's, it's, it's endless. And I just think that if we can engage students in as, if we can try to engage students in as many level, um, levels as we can, it would be great. And also, I mean, honestly, like I said, I grew up reading comic books, and I just really believe in the art and narrative power of comic books. I mean, they were influential to me. Um, you know, someone asked me, I was at a workshop this week, and someone said, you know, why did you keep going to school? And I was just kind of like, you know why? Because Dr. Reed Richards went to school. And it was, I mean, really, it was just like my, my heroes in comics, Dr. Banner, you know, all these guys. Um, they were educated, you know, Peter Parker, Went to college. I don't know if he ever finished. That. He just got uh, <laughs> when the Doc Ock was him. He got a P Doc Ock was ticked off that Peter Parker. He never got a PhD, so he got a PhD. Oh, he did get one. Okay, good. He did finally finish. <laughs> I'll be like Peter Parker. I'll get mine eventually. <laughs> so yeah. So you know, I just think that you know that there's a power, a narrative power that I think has been ignored um, historically behind comics because they were seen as kids there, and I think which was a little unfair. Um, uh, really quickly, I want to go over what are our learning outcomes for the class because I want you to know what it is I, I am supposed to be teaching as I engage in comics. 
Um, and I do think I, I meet these. And I think comic books can meet this. Okay, so I'm just going to read through this one. Real dry, boring slide. Uh, upon successful completion of the course, a student should be able to write verbally or in writing. Um, they should apply a variety of rhetorical strategies to write unified, well-organized essays with arguable theses and persuasive support. Analyze, interpret, and evaluate texts and sources, primary and secondary. Integrate the ideas of others through paraphrasing, summary, and quoting in appropriate documentation format. And demonstrate proofreading and editing techniques so that written work conforms to the conventions of standard written academic English. Basically, we have to teach them to read and write <laughs> at a college level. Um, so my class, picture of me playing with a G.I. Joe and Barbie. That was like, <laughs> like I said, multiple texts. That's, that's another one right there, G.I. Joe and Barbie. Um, I, I typically um, find themes with which to sort of um, hang my hat on. And that just made things easier for me as an instructor and, and more fun for me. Because, I mean, honestly, I, I, I do this because it's fun and I want it to stay fun. So I find things that I want to work with. It's kind of selfish, yes. But it also keeps me from hating my job. So uh, I've looked at things like Utopia, um, the American West, popular culture. Those are just some of the themes I've, I've worked with. Um, I utilize a I try, like I said, I try to utilize a variety of media. Television, movies, music, dolls. <laughs> um, and in comics, I've used typically as a capstone in the course. So I, I want to give them a foundation, sort of an analysis or um, investigation of one of these themes and ideas. And then we get to the comic. And I, I really like that to be sort of where they can stretch their wings and challenge themselves. Because it is something that is, oh, I, uh, how I describe it, deceptively complex. It looks like a con. Oh, it's words and pictures. How hard can it be? But no, there's a lot to it. It just doesn't seem so obvious. Um, I also think it meets, you know, all of the SLOs for the course. Those, that dry list that I read for you. And, uh, the comics I've used in the past are The Dark Knight Returns, The Watchmen, um, The Walking, and recently, and I've just done this one for one semester, The Walking Dead, Volume One, Days Gone By. Uh, the Dark Knight was the first one I used back in, you know, late '90s, and then I've used The Watchmen for a few years until I made a film. And I strayed away from it. Even though I don't like the film, it's, it's too tempting for students to watch it. Um, and, and now I've tried The, the Walking Dead. Uh, so both with, with Batman The Dark Knight Returns and The Watchmen, I used those when I studied, uh, I did a study of either popular culture or a utopian dystopian theme. Um, and, and the whole idea behind it was, uh, I, I wrote a paper in grad school about superheroes. <laughs> Um, I wrote a paper in grad school about uh, superheroes and what, what, what one critic called the utopian impulse, which really is about utopian writers trying to correct the problems of the world. And I thought, you know what, this idea that, that this writer is applying to um, authors really does apply to superheroes because that's kind of their impulse, that they want to write the world. They're correcting the world uh, sort of in their image. So I found that to be kind of a fascinating study. It's like, let's look at these guys who can and, and have the power to uh, make changes in the world, and then what happens. And oftentimes, things don't turn out perfect, which is what, one of the things I find great about these, because the best of intentions doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily end up with the best of results. So I've looked at uh, that. I also bring in some secondary texts, like uh, Gary Eagle's What Makes Superman So Darn American, which is really important in studying The Dark Knight, because I think it's important for us to understand the symbol of Superman as we're analyzing Batman. Uh, Andy Menders uh, wrote an article, Batman Deviants in Camp, which is about some of the uh, late homoeroticism of the Batman, um, which students like to resist that. They don't like to think of that idea. But I think it's important to at least discuss when you're talking about The Dark Knight, when you have a writer who changed Robin to a girl. And I think there is something there that, that can be investigated. I don't know how much, but it's fun to bring in and, and give students that option. Um, another article I've used is, I'm not fooled by the cheapest guy, which really just kind of discuss the icon iconography of Batman. And uh, there's a great documentary the History Channel made. They used to make, actually, pretty good documentaries. <laughs> this came out, I think, in the early 2000s. It was called Comic Book Superheroes Unmasked. Uh, and it's, really, it's awesome. It's about the history of the superhero. And it really is a great documentary. And I would recommend anyone using it if you, if you want to try to work with a superhero text. Uh, now, with The Walking Dead, 
uh, I did something a little different. I, it was in my, I went back to study popular culture again. Um, I got a little tired of my uh, utopian theme. So I thought, you know, I want to get back to pop culture. There are things in pop culture I'd like to investigate myself. And one of them was this metaphor of the zombie. You know, zombies are very popular right now. Why is that? So what I did is I decided to use the zombies as the last third of the course. Um, for that, we read other pop culture articles focusing on gender and identity. And really, it was kind of like, you see how these authors are looking at gender and identity? Now, we're going to take the zombie metaphor, and you're going to look at texts with zombies and try to determine what is the meaning of this, what I call the zombie metaphor. Um, so with that one, we looked at, although I did bring in academic articles also, I also had them, we watched a lot of movies <laughs> and read uh, you know, The Walking Dead and, and World War Z. So we, we worked with multiple uh, texts in this, uh, like I said, World War Z. The Walking Dead comic, and we also watched the first couple of episodes of the series. Uh, we um, watched Night of the Living Dead. I, I started with that because that really is the foundation of the modern zombie, where it leaves sort of that voodoo magical foundation and, and moves into sort of a postmodern monster. Uh, we watched Shaun of the Dead, uh, Warm Bodies, because there are different takes on um, a motif that's typically a horror motif made in the comedy or romance. Um, so we looked at all those, and then students, I had them tell me, okay, what do you think is the meaning of a zombie? What's the metaphor of meaning of a zombie? Meaning of a zombie? And, and I, I'd say I was thoroughly impressed with the work they did. I was, it shocked me. Um, I got it. Okay. I got it. Um, and, and some of the students, just to give you a little bit of feedback on what they said, I think I'm running long, sorry about this. Uh, the, the comic books give you a, give a good visual aid and are kind of laid back which made it a little easier for me to read. Um, comics are kind of like a movie, but with more depth. And I think they, when I, I think they're discussing that, they're talking about the internal uh, internalization that a, a comic can present us, that a movie doesn't necessarily present us with. Um, if one student said, if they're interested and engaged with the material, it will lead to greater learning, and more students might actually enjoy going to class. And I think that that kind of happened uh, with, especially with The Walking Dead. Uh, to me, reading comics doesn't feel like work or some reading assignment that I have to do. It's more enjoyable than reading some dusty old novel. I also like reading dusty old novels, but I understand and respect what the students say. And they can be equally challenging uh, as a book when they're analyzed. Uh, so just to wrap it up, uh, not everything is roses. There are still challenges, even when we work, I work with uh, comic books. Uh, and, and the biggest one, it, I think sometimes no matter what you put in front of a student, they sometimes feel resistant to it because you put it in front of them. You can tell them, hey, let's just study what you're texting, and they're going to hate that. Uh, <laughs> some students have difficulty following the narrative form of the comic, you know, how do they read it, and, and, and typically, surprisingly, uh, it's been female students who have had that, and I think it's because they never read a comic before. Uh, and then often with superhero narratives, what I found with, with Batman is there's a large mythology that they need to be aware of. And one of the reasons I use The Dark Knight is because of the movies in the 90s and even the movies that have come out recently, most students have a foundation for Batman. They know Bruce Wayne, they know that he has a cave and all that, right? They know his parents were killed. So they, they, they have a foundation, and I don't need to deal with that. Also with Watchmen, at the time there were no other Watchmen texts, so it was, it was enclosed, and the appendices tend to have the background they needed. So, you know, once again, I didn't need to inform them of a lot of history. So. Uh, but that is a challenge if I were to use other superhero narratives, is that there's a large mythology that they sometimes will need to be aware of. And that's it for now, for me. Uh, thank you very much. All right, so that was my goal. Uh, next up we have uh, Morgan Rose is Pershing. Pershing, I got it right the first try, I'm happy. Uh, from the Santa Clara City Library. Hello, okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Morgan. And I am a public librarian. I'm an adult services librarian with Santa Clara City Library. And I had a grant project a few years ago that I called the Project Science Step into Graphic Novels. Um, in, my in my research and opinion, graphic novels are often mentioned as great for reluctant readers and improving literacy in children and teens, but not so much for adults. So I wanted to do a project in an attempt to fill that gap. And for my grant, I had to come up with a project purpose. I know this is a long sentence, but uh, Project Sign advocates for the use of graphic novels through instruction and completion of a core collection 
as a tool for low literacy level adult learners, giving both teachers and students a new way to successfully increase literacy in this population. I had two community partners in my um, project, and the first of which was Mission College, which is a local community college to where I live in San Jose. Um, and to address that shocking statistic that you see there, uh, Mission offers a number of reading and English classes aimed at the more remedial levels and getting them up to speed. And I found three teachers who were willing to teach a graphic novel um, for one semester. I was really lucky. They were on board right away. Um, oh, I went too fast. Those are my teachers. Um, Aaron, Sue, and Sarah, and we met several times and what grew out of the meetings were that they were going to teach American-born Chinese to, during the spring semester, and it ended up being 13 classes. So 13 classes in this college are all learning the same text at the same time, which was far more than I expected. Um, I visited each class, and I presented on the history of graphic novels and why, why they're good for adult literacy. You see me there teaching the gutter, which is the middle of panels and what happens in your brain, um, and how reading graphic novels depend on intuition and imagination, um, sometimes more so than prose. Um, and I ask, always ask the class, my first question was, what do you think of when you hear comics? And all of, there was a lot of prejudice, you know, for kids, it's not real, it's not a real book. Um, so that was why I presented, to give them a more of background and um, to let them know that, you know, sometimes when you're reading prose, you're kind of being spoon-fed. You have that image in your mind. And some people aren't as good as having those kinds of images. So maybe a different kind of form would work for them. And with comics, you need to use the deductive reasoning to fill in the blanks. So your brain is really active when you're reading comics. Um, I was able to get Jean Yang, the author, to come do two events uh, in one day, one event at Mission College and one at my library, and I think it really brought um, the book home to the kids that they could meet the author and they could ask him questions, and for people who don't necessarily finish a lot of books, having finished a book and then meeting the author made it a more holistic experience. Um, and he's so gracious. If you guys ever have a chance, I don't know what your background is, but if you ever have a chance to work with him, he's so awesome. Um, but he wrote me a thank you note, which was crazy. Um, so for those two events, um, he presented to 200, 265 people, and I ended up presenting to 275 students. Um, by the end of their class, 20, there was a 20% increase in the amount of students who think graphic novels make you a better college reader after reading American Born Chinese. And 93% of the attendees to the program at my library said they would be more likely to read a graphic novel after seeing Jean present. Um, so yeah, I cannot emphasize enough, he's so awesome. Um, and this, the best anecdote to come out of the, the Mission College side of this project was um, this comic that you see was drawn by a student named Carmen. Um, prior to reading American Born Chinese, she had never drawn before, so apparently she watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos um, to figure out how to draw, and you can kind of see that she's got the kind of anime style going there. Um, so that in and of itself was amazing. But then I talked to her teacher about um, a year later, and since then, Carmen had started taking art classes, had moved up several levels in English and was getting straight A's. So it was like finding her art just opened her brain and that just was very touching for me. Um, and my teachers at Mission said that American Born Chinese was the most successful text they've ever used. So it worked out very well. Um, the other side of my project was working with Reed Santa Clara, which is my library's adult literacy um, program to help these people get up to speed. Um, and they had a pre-existing book group and I asked them if I could kind of glom onto their book group and use a graphic novel with them. And they were they said fine. So we used the arrival, which actually has no words at all. And if you guys don't know the arrival, um, it's my favorite graphic novel by far, I really suggest it. Um, 
So I led three two-hour sessions with the book group and about the book, and I gave them all their own copies, and that, did, that turned out to not to be enough time at all. And everyone loved it. And um, one of the tutors who sat in said, after reading this moving and beautifully illustrated story, ESL students in a weekly reading group broke into spontaneous chatter and shared what they had written on their own. The arrival is so rich in detail and cleverly told that every time I read it, I discover something else I had not noticed. Mm -hmm. So out of my experience with the book group, I made a kit that people can now check out from my library that has two copies of the arrival, suggested exercises, and vocabulary lists that I made up and um, they're free for anyone to use. And these, this was my publicity. Um, these postcards got sent out to all of the learners and all of the tutors in the Reed Santa Clara program. And the best anecdote from this side of the project was um, one of the ladies in the book group told us that her daughter found her copy of the arrival in the living room, sat down on a couch and read it for an hour and a half, and then she and her mom discussed it. And that's the kind of stuff if you're concerned with literacy. You know, that's huge. Um, and also, ESL, <coughs> just by its nature. Um, the arrival is an immigration story. So yeah. everyone who is ESL comes from someone else, somewhere else and has their own story to tell. And giving people a text that they can relate to uh, made it the perfect choice. Okay, now this isn't super rel relevant to um, <laughs> this talk, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. Uh, the third part of my project was that our graphic novel collection at my library was pretty sad. Um, that's what it used to look like. It was, they were um, hidden in the shelves and didn't get a lot of circulation. So I had money to buy um, new graphic novels and make a better collection. And so treating graphic novels as a medium, not a genre, because that's not what they are, um, we pulled all the graphic novels together and made them more visible. And here they are now on their own hmm. wall. Um, and the signage is actually a page from the arrival. And uh, people browse it now all the time, and circulation went up 30% in just a few months. So um, as far as libraries go, it's great to have them. They're great for browsing. You know, people just stand there and look at them. Um, and that was my project. That's, uh, that's it. So thank you. Oh, uh, really? I've suggested libraries to buy graphic novels. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it depends on the... Uh, it depends on the library and where we, uh, Richard like College is going to have a lot before we retire in the next uh, two years. That's just how that place is going. All right, so, hi, I'm John Latino. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, my use of comic books uh, for uh, literacy uh, in writing classes, English classes around Merced, uh, Merced. I do that around Merced. I used to work for Merced College, and I was working for UC Merced, um, but now I'm just at UC Merced. So I work with Michael, he's, he's a okay guy. Um, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> a little background about me. Uh, I, was, I, I started at Mercer College since 2006. I just recently quit, which was great. And, <laughs> uh, and I've been a lecturer at UC Mercer since 2012. Uh, and I'm now a full-time one over there. Uh, my background is largely in uh, philosophy and literature. Uh, and uh, that was fun. I did that at Stan State. Uh, and then my other degree is uh, like Morgan. I did a library information science degree at UCLA. Uh, I don't know. Okay, okay, so you're an SU, SU. And uh, I, there was really interesting, because I had an encounter there that changed um, a lot about the way I looked at uh, how, how, how literacy worked, was that I had, you know, I, I've been writing stuff for years in philosophy classes, literature classes, teaching kids how to write, all this stuff, and I'm sitting at UCLA, and I'm getting asked to catalog stuff, and they hand me stuff cataloging. I'm cataloging books, no, no one's business, easy to do. And then, then all of a sudden this print, it was like a print, I can't remember what it's from, uh, showed up in the pile, I'm like, I have no idea how to catalog this. I don't, I've never had to think about like how to describe the image, and I've never really been asked to write about imagery, just like philosophical ideas and the like. So I was like, that, that intrigued me. And I was reading comic books, I was like, you know, there's something to this. Um, and But what makes me most qualified, I think, to use comic books in the class is that uh, I love comic books. Like, I, I buy a lot. I buy like 120 comic books a month. Like, I'm not joking. Like, I, I seriously buy that many philosophies. All new comic books, not old stuff. Um, I'm ridiculous in that and uh, so is my, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's hard when we're talking to folks. But anyways, um, so literacy is an interesting concept because it's not, 
we we generally think of literacy in regards to like can can Johnny read, can Johnny write, and um, it isn't just a matter of that, but it, uh, it's a matter of decoding and, and, uh, and understanding what the words in the document do and the contextualization of them, how to navigate amongst those, and how to like get yourself to understand them and subsume them into your understanding to ergo then uh, do the next step or whatever it may be, or try to push yourself past it. And writing is the reverse of that, where you're taking your ideas in your head and encoding them and trying to make sure that somebody else can grab those out and maneuver through those themselves, too. Um, and that, that's, uh, it's a lot more complex than just like pronouncing the words off the page. When I was in elementary school, that's all I really cared about. Can you pronounce this word and read this sentence out loud? Not necessarily understand it. Um, but the thing about it is there's a lot more to literacy than even to reading and writing. Uh, literacy comes in tons of forms now. Um, one of the big ones, uh, I'm sure Morgan deals with information literacy constantly, where we're concerned with uh, how do you navigate information, how do you find information, do you know how what good information is or what bad information is, do you know how to assess this, or do you just accept it on face value? Uh, visual literacy, that is how we maneuver visually. Um, like in this room right now, even your shirts and, and everything, there's a certain visual element to it that reflects, like, and navigate those. Uh, that's a big part of comics, is the navigation of, of visuals. Um, computer literacy, can you use a computer, do you know how to the basic logic of it, can you navigate that kind of uh, format? Technology literacy, do you understand how stuff actually works? Um, cultural literacy, do you know how to engage a culture and kind of do it? Media literacy, health literacy, ecological literacy, there's all these literacies out there. And it's, it's, each one basically means that can you get into it and understand how to engage in it and also how to pull information out and make that information meaningful and not just be dumb about it, for lack of a better term. Um, so I was really interested in visual literacy, and that's what I realized when I was, when I was asked to catalog that piece, is that I really lacked a certain level of visual literacy. Um, and I had a master's degree, I just took in college, of course I know what things are, I mean, of course I know what literacy is, well it turns out I didn't. So, uh, comics and graphic novels, uh, much like, uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you, if you engage uh, Scott McCloud's understanding comics, um, I use this definition largely, and I think it's probably one of the best definitions out there, I've been hard pressed to find a better one. Um, and I actually used the class text in my um, uh, I was class called English 13, Philosophy 13, and also now writing 10, which is a critical writing class. The principle I use is because McLeod forms a huge argument in his uh, book. He's not just saying, like, this is how it works. He's, like, arguing for it, and he makes a lot of good arguments. And he does emotional appeal. He does you know, the three pillars, the ethos, pathos, and logos. And um, I have my students analyze that, but at the same time, they're also learning how comic books kind of work. So when we actually engage the comic books, they have some sort of literacy of comic books as opposed to just going into a blind. And McLeod, you know, if, you if you read his book, he, be he becomes your friend in it. So, um, so some of the reason I use them is uh, I like using multiple mediums. Uh, right now, we live in an increasingly multimedia world. Uh, things are rarely in one medium. Um, if you pick up your smartphone right now, it's using both text and visuals. Um, and quite frankly, I think a smartphone has more in common with a comic book than it does with a novel. Um, so you have to think about how do you correlate these ideas and icons and such. Um, develop skills of inference, obviously, Morgan talked about using the gutter, that's a big part. Um, McLeod talks about, he shows you this image of this guy with an axe, you know, going swinging it, and this guy, this guy screaming, no, and then you see this next panel, there's like a city escape, someone screaming, and the idea is like, you're inferring that the guy killed the guy, but like, McLeod's like, I never showed you killing the guy, you killed the guy, you're the one that figured it out yourself. Mm -hmm. So inference is really interesting, that's a big part of critical stuff. So. Uh, elaborate contextualization. I mean, if you're talking about mythology, you gotta contextualize Batman. You gotta think about when he was created and how the circumstances of his creation, the circumstances of the mythology, why are these characters interesting, how they rise up. Very few of them rose up independently of anything. The Joker is derived from a movie, for God's sake, so the man in the last, right? So yeah, I mean, he's straight taken right out of that, off the movie poster. Um, extremely diverse content. There's something for everybody in comics. Um, Whatever you're into, you can find something. If you're into My Little Pony, there's that. If you're into like hardcore horror comics, there's that. If you're into erotic comics, there's that. If you're into superheroes, there's that. If you're into hardcore sci-fi, there's that. Um, and right now, it's a high level of interest. But like Guardians of the Galaxy made what, 90 million over the weekend? Yeah, people are interested in this stuff, right? There's, there's no, I can't, it's hard to argue against 90 million dollars. Um, so, um, some of the challenges uh, Michael talked about, um, I have a problem with students, students not taking it seriously. I've had students like go like, what the hell are you doing? Like, I paid for this, you're gonna, I was gonna read comics, and they're irked. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna read that, you know, and it pays off, so some, you get a little bit of student resistance. Uh, publisher support, publishers right now, um, if you're doing Marvel and DC, it's kind of a problem, they don't, they don't support it too much. Um, I've had some success now with, with the creator-owned comics, 
um, is what I'm really interested in using now because the creators can say, yes, you can use that. And um, I've actually had uh, Matt Hawkins from TopCal, uh, he's actually given me PDFs to distribute to my students freely of a of think tank, the first trade, actually the first trade, um, as long as for educational use, as opposed to having my students go buy the book. Um, was, you know, he's, oh, that's great, yeah, you know, he likes that. Um, if you read Matt Hawkins stuff, it's very well researched. There's like citation. There's a citation in the back of each, each issue, which I love. Um, mm. Plus, this current book takes place on, camp, on campus at UCLA, which I really enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's also a lack of instruction, knowledge, and resources. I've seen a lot of faculty members, not Michael, but other faculty members at Merced College who have used them, and they don't know much about the medium. Yeah. They they know that there's Mouse, they Watchmen, um, Persepolis, and outside of that, they're like. Cricket, cricket. Maybe Walking Dead once in a while, but um, yeah, a few are using Walking Dead now. Yeah, so it's still pretty. There's still kind of a lack of like understanding visual literacy because if you go through a lit program or an English program, they don't really tell you how to like look at imagery. Maybe how to like appreciate a painting, but not how to like navigate multiple sequential images. Um, how to touch curriculum policy. I've had problems at different institutions with people going, "Why would you do this? This is stupid. Um, I don't think this is appropriate for the class." Um, and it's. It's kind of a, this is always a challenge you face when you're trying to use a different medium. Uh, there's always a change in the guard and the like, but uh, it's happened slowly, but I haven't had, the problems have been minuscule, um, but especially when I show them successes, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So my classroom experiences is the first book I use is Batwoman Volume 1 Hydrology. Um, this is uh, written by Jason III and uh, Hayden Blackman, and uh, this book um, is really actually narrative. Uh, it's also it's not a graphic novel. That's a big thing I've been trying to tell students is that it's a trade. It's a collection of individual issues republished into this format, and that makes it a little bit different. And students are kind of well, it's an ongoing story. There's more to it after this. It didn't just stop, um, as opposed to a self-contained graphic novel. Um, and uh, I use this more, mostly because of multicultural content. The story deals with Batwoman, who is a, a lesbian character who's been kicked out of the military for that. That's her origin story. It deals with her fighting the villain La Llorona from Mexican mythology. And uh, she, uh, and the Mexican, and La Llorona preys on the Mexican American community in Gotham City, and the Mexican American community has a conflict with the police. They feel like they're not helping them because of who they are. So it's really interesting kind of a lot of dynamics that students can relate to uh, in that, into that regard. Multiculturalism is definitely a big push in uh, higher education, trying to get students exposed to different cultures. I have some examples of the pages uh, from James Williams III. Um, one, this, this is a really fascinating piece because you have uh, this um, kind of uh, interesting background that's incorporated into the paneling. So we have, we have uh, what amounts to actually only, uh, let's say, six panels. But except for the, the second to last isn't actually a panel, it's actually part of the, the picture. It's actually part of the, the background. It's really, and so students have to learn how to navigate that and read that. Um, here, for example, the top one, we have what appears to be, what, five bat women? There's not five bat women. We know that. We see it as action, though. We can animate it in our heads. The students have to learn how they're doing that. Um, and then we have uh, this great piece of her coming through the window. I see the cape, and we can kind of see the flow of motion of the cape swooping in and her being ahead of her cape and such um, to interrogate this guy. And then you get a crazy stuff like this where the styles change on the page as it goes along. Uh, Williams is known for this. And that each style means a different mean, has a different meaning. So you have the gradation of Batwoman, of her being very toned. Um, showing her kind of gray areas. You have Kate by herself, uh, who's very clear line because she knows who she is. You have her and her, her younger self, which uh, is uh, drawn in a very classical comic book style. Um, and then you have stuff like this, which just flows and does this insane thing where you have to understand it. You have to really take time to figure out what's happening, how it's moving, and what it all means. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like uh, William stuff so much. So some of the stuff that you see her said, I use this in a critical writing class. Um, and I, had, I asked students questions about this, like, how does that one's use of multiculturalism, uh, how is it good or how is it bad? Um, this book has won several GLAAD awards, that's the Gay Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And it's won for the media awards, I believe, tw once or twice, I can't remember. Um, the first depictions of a, of a lesbian lead character. It's also the first title, the first mainstream comic book where the title character is a lesbian or, or, or gay. Um, and uh, really to the depiction of the Mexican Americans in the book, uh, it uses a popular Mexican uh, uh, piece of folklore. Anybody, anybody here, who here has heard of La Llorona? Right? Okay, good fortune of you, right? And this has a different take on it. And the, the students really, 
I, when I asked my classes who knew it, it was about, out of the 20 students, I believe it was like, uh, I'd say 16 of them knew it. And they all had their different versions of the story, different takes, and how they learned. It was a big part of their culture, and they grew up with it. And I grew up with it too, uh, like Amber said. So, um, and we were interested in kind of how do they show it. Uh, some of the students did genealogies of La Llorona, like how did the story emulate to come to this point. And uh, we also had some really interesting critical inquiries about using the medium. Um, but one of the major questions we had about this was, okay, so the guys that write this, for, I know for a fact, are straight white males, flat out, straight white males. And they're writing award-winning um, uh, uh, stuff based on the homosexual community. Uh, why is that? What are they doing that's like so good when like TV shows can barely get it right, or can't get it right half the time? Or um, when La Llorona is used in a Got Milk commercial down in Los Angeles, and it's protested by, yes, they, if you know the legend of La Llorona, she basically her story is a ghost, she encounters bodies of water, and she kills children. And they were using that to try to sell milk in Los Angeles a few years back, and it didn't really make any sense. <laughs> Because kids were scared to drink milk. <laughs> right. You use, and I explained, so you're using the murderer of children to sell milk to children. That doesn't go so well. So, um, but they did, they did a good job with it. So it's kind of an interesting question about that. And I asked the students, do you, like, you know, do you think this is respectful? Yes or no? And they mentioned the class. Um, uh, uh, Williams is a good friend of mine. I actually brought him to the class. And he, as part of the research project, they got to interview him and ask him, you know, how, how did you come to this conclusion? How did you build this research? And he just said, yeah, I looked it up and I researched it. and. I pay attention to what people are saying, as opposed to like saying what do people what appeals to people. I want to see what actually the story was. Uh, the other book I used recently at Princeton College was *The Massive* by Brian Wood. Um, this is a creator-owned book out of uh, Dark Horse, and uh, it deals with a global kind of environmental collapse. And it, it's about an environmentalist group. And the question is like, what does it mean to be an environmentalist after the environment just goes gone? <laughs> this is bad. And it deals with the geopolitical issues of that too. Um, so what I did with this is uh, I asked students, how do you, you know, does this depict this well? Is this well researched? Does this seem plausible? Um, do you think that these, um, how do you think these environmental issues come about? What does the book's explanation of these make sense? Uh, does the ramifications of these things make sense? And then um, I was really interested in one thing this book does a really good job of is showing the uh, geopolitical impact of the environment. So like if you know if the U.S. loses. Uh, 15 miles of coastland, what does that do to it? Um, how does that displace uh, government? A um, big part of the book is like nobody knows what the U.S. government's doing because they're no longer in Washington, D.C., they're in Colorado. There's like splinter governments and overseas is a whole other different story. It's really fascinating. Um, well, they did some research on different, on different issues in there, whether it was like uh, the harvesting of shark fins or it was what does it mean for a city to lose its uh, ports or um, you know, about oil rigs, there's all kinds of stuff they could, they could get out of it. Um, and so I'm really, uh, basically from this, what I want you to take away from it is uh, literacy is more than words. It's not just a matter of reading or writing. That's what, that is what we classically think of it, and that's what we're concerned with, but it's not just like being able to pull a word off the page or pronounce it. It's about like, can you actually navigate through these things? And whatever you're into, there's a, there's a literacy to it. Um, and then uh, comics make great launching points. That's my big my big spiel thesis. I wasn't trying to say like, hey, read this comic book, it's great. I did say that, but <laughs> it, was, it was more about like, can you read this thing and then find points to get you thinking about other things outside of it? And how does that make you interested? Um, and that was, the, that was probably the best part. A lot of probably wouldn't really care about uh, depictions of Mexican Americans in, in, um, uh, on television, even though a lot of my students are Mexican American. Um, they didn't really care about LGBT characters being depicted in major in mainstream media, but when they started engaging this, like, wow, this is really good, and this is a part of the character, and it really enhances it enhances the story, makes it a big part of the story, um, or it's just a part of the story. It's not the story. Also, they uh, they found it interesting. They wanted to try and find more about it, um, and then that's it. So I think uh, we're gonna do Q and A for the last back half of this. Um, we'll take questions. We need some time to think of a question. No problem. We're here. But, uh, yes, sir. Okay, I'm completely fascinated by by all three. Uh, I oh, actually sweet. went to high school with Jim Williams. Oh, okay, yeah. Hung, hung out with him in his house. Which, I was really good friends with him. At Water High. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I was really good friends you know, with him. You know Michael Smith? Michael yeah. Smith? Yeah, yeah, he owns a comic book store, I said. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, no, yeah, um, and I teach, uh, I teach 1984 Great New World, which is often referred to in a lot of zombie literature mm -hmm. classes, and so I'm really fascinated in the this whole idea, um, but I teach AP Lit, 
um, at a local high school here in Stockton. Um, and it's not a uh, it's not a thoroughbred class of AP students. These are um, AP students that you know the college board's kind of opened up and say any kid who wants to do okay, it. Okay, gotcha. So I have a I have a lot of kids who uh, aren't into reading, but mm -hmm. they want to challenge themselves and just trying to figure out how I can uh, get kids into to seeing the imagery is a real hard thing for students these mm -hmm. days because everything's on TV. Yeah. Everything they want instant media they can take out their phone and they have right. it so just trying to teach these kids basic yeah. literacy skills when it comes to understanding imagery and so it's really interesting yeah the public school is a lot different um, than what the we're doing in regards to the like i know that content can be very objectionable very quickly to people um and i i think you'd have to like i don't like i, I would see Doing like something like Batwoman, like in a high school class, would be difficult because right. there's like I mean, there's a love scene in like the book. Um, there's right. nothing explicit, but it's like you know what's going on. Um, so I, I can see that being an issue. Uh, I like I'm kind of curious about the um, like I would I would recommend stuff that would be a little more um, I don't know like what, what would you recommend on hand? There's so much non superheroes. Yeah, yeah, that's a big part there's of it. So much. It's such a rich time for that. So many awesome memoirs and historical events. I mean, March that yeah, just March. came out, um, and you know you could even go with the classics like Persepolis and Mouse. I mean, yeah. they have great historical context. Because I've done, uh, they, I know in some of the literature books they've used uh, metamorphoses. They mm -hmm. have a graphic novel of Kafka's Metamorphosis, which makes it easier to, for the kids to understand because it's such a dense right. piece of text. But. Uh, Looking, Topka is a little yeah, it's a little heavy. For stocking kids, it seems a little. I, I would really recommend March Volume One. It's the John Lewis story. It's a uh, autobiography of his uh, dealing with the, uh, the civil rights movement. It's the first graphic novel to be endorsed by a president. Clinton endorsed it, um, and that book is a brilliant, brilliant, well written book. Um, okay. And you'd be hard pressed to find. A school board or principal that would object to you using it because it's so like universally just, just loved and it's a great, it's a great, a really inspirational story. March volume one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I teach math and science, and so when I came in here, I was uh, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, they're going to talk about you know how to create comics in the classroom and stuff like that. Can't crawl. Uh, and <laughs> when I started, when I started doing that last year is. Uh, the Common Core coming in, uh, a lot of the math is now more of a plot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started having them be drafted and, and uh, the orders for drafted, mm -hmm. And uh, discovered that many of them didn't know how to use a ruler or mm -hmm. anything like that. And it was very disturbing. And, uh, and it occurred to me that getting them to draw comic book panels and then our um, comics in it would also be a bit of like the thing, but I don't know how, and I don't know the first thing about it. Well, but, you know. The first book I would recommend for any educator in the wants to try use comics is get Scott McCloud's understanding comics. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Scott McCloud's understanding comics. Um, uh, that book, all, all three of us referenced it. Yeah. yeah. It, it changes um, how you look at comics and how you look at visual mediums. And even though it's now what 20 years old, it's it's still up to date. Um, and we can thank Kevin Eastman for that book, but uh, it's it's yeah it's, you can go get it anywhere like it's you can go find it on a store on Amazon whatever it's, it's inexpensive. And I use it as a text as a text so class. Yeah, how that works, how we kind of visually think. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And then also, uh, in terms of how, I mean, like a, there's a graphic novel about uh, Hitler and Tesla's life. Mm -hmm. I would, suggestions? the current book, the, most, the best scientifically researched book, books out right now are by Matt Hawkins from Top Cow at uh, Image Comics. There's one called Think Tank. It's about a child genius who basically he's grown up now, he's in his 20s, and he works for DARPA. And he's basically like told to come up with ways to kill people. And he's kind of has moral objections to this, but he's like really scientific and minded. And he has another book out that's just sort of called Wildfire. It's about the dangers of uh, genetic um, uh, manipulation of plants. Um, it's basically like they they have this like they, they have this way to make plants grow quickly and go to maturity, 
but they can do it in the lab and like somebody wants a public demonstration and they do it on a dandelion and, and one of the seeds gets out and like basically Los Angeles is covered in dandelions within three days. Like and then they dry out and they catch on fire. It's just really, really well researched. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I recommend that one highly. Do you, have any, you guys have any ones for science or math? Because it's easy for lead. You can read lead. That's the beauty of lead. Yeah. Although something that might be interesting with math, I was thinking is if you could uh, come up partner with a, an English teacher who has an interest in comics, together the two of you could create a comic because they can handle the narrative uh, side of, of, of the story. And then you could handle sort of the measurements and you know, that practical side that we're talking about with math. I mean, that, that would kind of be an interesting uh, there's collaboration. A, there's a book that just started on an image, and the book is all about um, these, this boy and this girl that basically, it's aimed at young readers, and it's boy and girl, and basically like they solve problems around them, uh, go on adventures, and they make things. And in the book provides instructions on how to make little models of the things. Um, so the, and they all have a little science experiments in each book. I can't remember the name of it. Just, it just started, the issue one barely just came out. But if you look at the image of the uh, web page, they'll have it up there for sure. There's also the idea of just taking a book and talking about the feasibility scientifically. Uh, because, because, you know, comic books are so fantastic. Um, some things are within the realm of possibility, some are not. And you can talk about those ideas behind, I don't know, uh, an Iron Man armor. Or something. And that would be uh, another way you could use it. There's um, uh, for mathematic. Do you see math or science? I, I teach both. Teach both. Um, the second issue of Watchmen is um, set up as a mirror. Mm -hmm. The uh, the the uh, panel layout at the beginning um, it runs up to the center of the book and then it mirrors itself on the other uh, on the other end. So I mean, if you're looking for like practice with measurements and things like the that, surgery. that's something that you yeah. could that you could use. Yes, sir. My question is for Michael. Uh, which comic means or character comics have their English grammar punctuation and content of words? I'm sorry, what was the last part of that question? Oh, the content, English grammar punctuation and content with words and, and the art. Which uh, themes or uh, sets do you find? Um, well, I don't really deal with uh, the grammar punctuation with the comic. The comic is usually I've used as a, the capstone to the course because we begin by uh, investigating the theme or the issue through other texts first. Uh, so for example, when I'm using Utopia, obviously I read Utopia first. Uh, I read a play called God's Country. They're already writing papers and we're already, we've already kind of worked through ellipses there. That means something specific. A comma means something as opposed to a period in terms of spoken language. And, and we'll talk about it in terms of, okay, now the grammar really is important in reflecting to us what that character is saying. So I, I, I addressed it in that way, but not as a as a learning tool <laughs> for grammar punctuation. Yeah, it, it's there's this, I think the best lesson on a like from a literary English point of view you can learn on comics like is contextualization. If you contextualize those words, and like because my students read Babel and they're like, I don't know what the hell happened. I'm like, did you look at the pictures? Or like, oh, yeah, that makes a difference. So yes, ma'am. A comment for you. What grade range are you shooting for? High school and adult. High school and adult. Um, Something that worked with my kids when they were in middle school. I would take our home scanner and scan in a comic that I knew they, they read in the newspaper and then blur out all of the text. Mm, yeah. They had to provide the text and then we would read it and compare to teach specific things like when to use a semicolon versus a colon. That's a great idea. So that helps. <laughs> But, but now that there's a net, an internet, you can do things with PDFs and you don't have to make 15, 16 steps. <laughs> uh, my specific question was for you. Mm -hmm. I'm now volunteering as an adult tutor, uh -huh. and I'm having some difficulty with vocabulary. He's reached a level of literacy that's actually right about his functional vocabulary in English. I'm looking for ways to use comics to teach visual definitions, like the arrival of the I mean, he had trouble with the word sunset as a reader because he didn't have a thing to the meaning in English. Right. And I'm sorry, my, my ability in his language is non existent. Right. <laughs> so, do you have any specific suggestions of that one? Um, well, why I think the arrival would be perfect is because of the no words and there it's all visual. Right. You have to. Um, I made, I made my own vocabulary list for it, picking out 
picking things in the pictures that I thought maybe they wouldn't know yet. And then you look at the picture and that, you know, for some people, really works to get it into their brain. Um, I think that you could use any comic in that respect because it doesn't have to be a word from what they're saying or describing. It can be something that's in the picture. Um, so if you were willing to do the work to you know, make up your own list, um, if you found a, a comic that you could you could reach your students on many different levels because they could be reading the comic and then also looking at the pictures and the definitions of things that aren't necessarily you know, spoken about. I tell my students that I'm willing to put in as much work as they are. As they so if they're doing the work, I'm doing extra things. I'm gonna, yeah. I recommend, uh, there's an essay by Sherman Alexi called Superman and Me. It's about how he learned to read on Indian reservation as a kid. Basically, he was reading comic books. And like the classic comic books are so, you know, Superman, it say Superman burst through the wall, and then it shows a picture of Superman burst through the wall. That's how he picked up what these words meant. Um, there's a really interesting subversive way to do that. But there's still, there's still uh, uh, books like that out once uh, here and there. It's a little harder to find them, but uh, uh, Sherman Alexi. Yeah. I eat, sorry, yeah. And then uh, it's Sherman, yeah, and um, Superman, I mean. He's, he's, a, he's a huge Native, a, yeah. a huge we'll Native American proponent. Yeah. Native American himself yeah. from a tribe up in Washington, yeah. uh, but really is outspoken for Native American rights. Yeah, like I said, read everything he's ever written, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, <laughs> he's a great writer. Yeah, and it's, good, it's a good story of like uh, subversive ways to find how to read and like how yeah. to kind of trick to people in, uh, it, 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 it puts a lot of students so. But that's it for time, we are, we are out of it. Uh, thank you very much for coming everybody. Hope you had a good time, learned something, thank you.